Welcome to the chapter on nephrology. In the first section, I will be providing a basic overview of the anatomy and discussing the concept of fluid compartments. Let's get started. The renal system consists of the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. However, throughout this chapter, we will primarily be focusing on the physiology of the kidneys. The kidneys have many functions, including the production of urine, the removal of waste products like urea or drugs, electrolyte and nutrient homeostasis, acid-base regulation and blood volume homeostasis, and the release of hormones such as erythropoietin, which stimulate the production of red blood cells. Before we jump into the details of all of these functions, let's take a moment to review some of the basic anatomy. This is figure 4.1 from your text, and here we're looking at some of the normal anatomy of the kidney. As you'll remember from anatomy, the kidney actually consists of a cortex and a medulla. On this image, the cortex is shown here, and the medulla is the inner or middle portion right here. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney, which is a microscopic structure and can't be seen on this image. If you could see the nephron grossly, however, it would start somewhere up here, and dip down into the medulla and then come back up like this. I'll discuss in more detail the anatomy of the nephron on the next slide. The renal artery is a direct branch of the aorta and it provides blood to the kidneys. After several branches the renal artery provides blood to the nephron through the afferent arterial. Blood is filtered as it passes the nephron which results in the production of urine. Urine drains from the nephron into the ureter, which can then be stored in the bladder and ultimately excreted through the urethra. Examiners love to test about the clinical relevance of the variation in urethral size in men compared to women. Do you know which gender has the shorter urethra and how this is clinically relevant? Let's pull up a blank slide so I can show you what I'm talking about. This is the kidney the ureter, bladder, and the urethra. Women have a shorter urethra which makes it easier for bacteria to ascend into the bladder resulting in cystitis or infection of the bladder. Normally the ureters enter the bladder at an angle as I've drawn here which mitigates the movement of fluid from the bladder up the ureters and into the kidneys. They also contain valves, which help further reduce the risk. However, if the anatomy is at all abnormal, then there is an increased risk of cystitis becoming complicated pyelonephritis, or infection of the kidneys. This is due to movement of bacteria from the bladder to the kidneys. Okay, moving along, this is figure 4.2 from your text, which shows the normal anatomy of the nephron. So let's go through this. Here we have the glomerulus. This is the proximal convoluted tubule. And you'll notice right here the nephron gets smaller. So this is called the thin descending limb. This is where the nephron dips down into the medulla. And then it ascends back up. So this is called the ascending limb. And notice how it's a little bit thicker here. So we call it the thick ascending limb. Just after that, we have the distal convoluted tubule, and then finally the collecting duct. Again, my goal here is to provide you with a bird's eye view of the anatomy. We'll obviously go into much more detail about the physiology of each section of the nephron as we progress through the chapter. Okay, now let's go into a little more detail about the glomerulus. This is figure 4.3 from your text, which shows the normal anatomy of the glomerulus. The glomerulus is just this tuft of capillaries that we can see right here. And it's surrounded by Bowman's capsule. So this is Bowman's capsule. It goes all the way around the capillaries. As I mentioned before, the afferent arteriole, which you can see right here, contains blood that enters the glomerulus. The efferent arteriole contains blood leaving the glomerulus. 
In order for molecules to travel from the glomerulus to Bowman space, they must pass through three layers. And these are important to know for step one. So they must go through the endothelial cells, okay, the basement membrane, and the podocytes. The basement membrane and podocytes contain negatively charged glycoproteins, which repel and prevent the filtration of like-charged molecules. Additionally, the small diameter of the podocyte fenestrations, or openings, help repel the filtration of large particles, such as proteins or red blood cells. You can see here that the distal convoluted tubule is adjacent to the glomerulus. This is where the juxtaglomerular apparatus resides, which we'll discuss in more detail in future lectures. Okay, this is figure 4.4 from your text, which shows the normal histology of the glomerulus. So this is the glomerulus, and here is Bowman space. So blood is filtered from here into Bowman space. Okay, moving on to fluid compartments. The human body is approximately 60% water by weight. This is sometimes referred to as total body water, or TBW. This can be further divided into intracellular and extracellular compartments. The intracellular compartment comprises 40% of the body weight, and the extracellular compartment comprises 20% of the body weight. So intracellular is 40% of the weight, and the extracellular space is 20% of the weight. The extracellular space can again be divided into the interstitium and the plasma. The interstitium is just the space between cells, and the plasma is the fluid in the blood excluding the red blood cells. The interstitium comprises 15% of the body weight, and the plasma comprises 5% of the body weight. Okay, here's a question. How does anaphylaxis affect these compartments? Let's draw this out on the next slide. Remember, anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction that occurs when an antigen cross-links with an IgE antibody that binds to a mast cell, causing it to release histamine. So this is an antigen. Binds to an IgE antibody, which binds to the mast cell. The mast cell contains histamine, which is released in response to the IgE antigen complex. Histamine causes dilation of the smooth muscle cells of the arterioles, resulting in vasodilation. It also increases the permeability of postcapillary venules by causing contraction of the pericytes. This is a vessel, and these represent pericytes. Pericytes are cells that surround the endothelial cells, as I've drawn here, and as they contract, they increase the space between the endothelial cells, which results in the movement of fluid from the plasma to the interstitium. So P for plasma, I for interstitium. So as you can see that in a patient with anaphylaxis, the plasma volume would go down, the volume in the interstitium would increase, and the volume in the extracellular fluid compartment would be unchanged. This is because the extracellular fluid compartment consists of both the plasma and the interstitium. Ultimately, the fluid accumulation in the interstitium is clinically manifested as edema. The different fluid compartments can be measured clinically using different substances. For example, tritiated water can be used to measure the total body water because it's dispersed in all the body compartments equally. Mannitol can be used to measure the extracellular fluid compartment because its large size prevents it from crossing cellular membranes. Evans Blue can be used to measure the plasma volume because it tightly binds to albumin and is prevented from leaving the vasculature. 
the interstitium and the plasma volume can be measured indirectly using these other values. For example, if we take the total body water and subtract the extracellular compartment, we can determine the volume of the intracellular compartment. So knowing the specific names of each of these substances isn't incredibly important. For step one, it's more important to know that the different compartments can be measured clinically and how to do it. In order to measure the volume in a compartment, a known mass of one of these substances is injected into a patient depending on the compartment we want to measure. The substance is allowed to equilibrate over the course of several hours. The amount of the substance that was lost in the urine is measured, and then the patient's blood is drawn in order to measure the concentration of the substance. Using the equation volume equals amount over concentration allows us to determine the volume of the compartment. Let's draw out an example to make this clear. Okay, so here's a simple picture showing the different compartments. This represents the interstitium, the plasma, and the intracellular fluid compartment. Remember, the plasma and the interstitium make up the extracellular fluid compartment. Let's say we inject 100 milligrams of mannitol because we're interested in determining the volume of the extracellular compartment. Remember, mannitol is too large to cross cell membranes, so it can only stay in the blood or diffuse into the interstitium. It cannot go into the intracellular fluid compartment. We then wait for a few hours and allow the mannitol to equilibrate in both of these compartments. During this time, let's say 10 milligrams of mannitol was lost in the urine. Now we draw a sample of blood and measure the concentration of mannitol. Let's say the concentration of mannitol in the blood at this time is 6.5 milligrams per liter. Using the equation volume equals amount over concentration allows us to determine the volume of the extracellular compartment. Remember, V represents the volume of the extracellular compartment. A represents the amount of mannitol remaining in the body. This would be calculated by subtracting 10 milligrams from 100 milligrams because the patient lost 10 milligrams of mannitol in the urine. C represents the concentration of mannitol in the blood after we've allowed for the mannitol to equilibrate. In this case, we were given a value of 6.5 milligrams per liter. So if we plug these numbers in, we get A equals 100 minus 10, which is 90, and C is 6.5. So 90 over 6.5 gives us 13.8 liters. Because we use mannitol, this represents the volume of the extracellular fluid compartment. Osmolarity is the concentration of a solution. Sodium chloride and glucose are major physiologic contributors to osmolarity. When talking about the movement of water between fluid compartments, it's assumed that sodium chloride cannot cross the cellular membrane but that water freely shifts between the compartments in response to changes in osmolarity. Normally, the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid compartment is equal to the osmolarity of the intracellular fluid compartment. Okay, let's do a few examples. How would the water shift in a patient who has been given an IV bolus of normal saline? Let's draw this out on the next slide. So again, this is a diagram of the different compartments. For simplicity, we'll just draw the extracellular fluid compartment and the intracellular fluid compartment. Normally the osmolarity of each compartment is the same. So let's say the osmolarity is 100. If we add sodium chloride and water to the plasma through an IV, then the osmolarity of the extracellular compartment will remain unchanged. This is because both water and sodium chloride have been added to the solution, so the concentration of sodium chloride hasn't changed, which means the osmolarity of the solution hasn't changed. 
The volume of the extracellular compartment, however, will go up. This is because we've added water to the compartment. It's important to know that because the osmolarity hasn't changed, no redistributions in water will occur. In other words, no water from the intracellular fluid compartment will move to the extracellular fluid compartment in response to the water and salt we've infused. This is called isoosmotic volume expansion. In other words, the osmolarity of the compartments has stayed the same, but the volume of the extracellular fluid compartment has gone up. The exact opposite would occur in a patient who is losing equal concentrations of sodium chloride and water. An example of this would be someone with diarrhea, and this is called isoosmotic volume contraction. Okay, what would happen if we just infused sodium chloride without water? Again, this is the intracellular fluid compartment and the extracellular fluid compartment. We've just added sodium chloride. So the concentration of sodium chloride and osmolarity in the extracellular compartment would go up. As a result, water from the intracellular compartment would cross into the extracellular compartment. Because water in the intracellular compartment starts to decrease, the concentration of sodium chloride in the intracellular compartment begins to increase, causing the osmolarity to increase as well. Water would continue to leave the intracellular compartment until the osmolarity of the intracellular compartment and the extracellular compartments are equal. Ultimately, the volume of the intracellular compartment would decrease. And the volume of the extracellular compartment would increase. This is also called hyperosmotic volume expansion. In other words, the osmolarity of the extracellular compartment has gone up and this has resulted in an increase in volume. Can you think of a neurological pathology associated with hyperosmotic volume expansion? Central pontine myelinolysis. This is a disease caused by infusing too much sodium, which results in damage to the white matter of the pons and causes paralysis. Okay, one last question. How would sweating during a long hike affect the redistribution of water? Okay, here's the intracellular fluid compartment, and this is the extracellular fluid compartment. For this question, it's important to know that sweat actually contains more water than salt. So water is being lost from the extracellular compartment as I've drawn here. As a result, the osmolarity of the extracellular compartment goes up. water from the intracellular compartment begins to shift to the extracellular compartment until the osmolarity of both compartments are equal. Although the extracellular compartment is receiving water from the intracellular compartment, the overall volume of the extracellular compartment decreases. This is because excessive loss of water is occurring through sweat. In the end, the volume of both the intracellular compartment and extracellular compartments decrease. This is called hyperosmotic volume contraction. There are almost an infinite number of possibilities when it comes to the redistribution of water, so I'm not going to go over any more examples. But hopefully from the past several examples, you've grasped the idea. Obviously, understanding the general idea here is much more important than memorizing each example.